and we're good. All right, we will call the regular meeting of the Madison Local Board of Education from March 16th, 2021 to order. If we could have the flag for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, States, States of America, America. And to the republic, to the republic for, which for which it stands, stands. And one nation, one nation under, under God, 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 indivisible, liberty, and justice, and justice for all. Justice for all. Roll call, please. Sean Douglas. Here. Michael Howry. Here. Michelle Hayes. Here. Brian Horvath. Here. Gene Sensi. Here. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? <clears throat> I'll move. I'll move. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Sean Douglas. Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Brian Horvath? Yes. Gene Sensi? Yes. Vote is 5 0. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of February 2nd, 2021? I'll move. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Ryan Horvath? Yes. Dean Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Vote is 5 0. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of February 16th, 2021? I move. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Roll call. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Ryan Horvath? Yes. Gene Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Vote is 5 0. All right, we will now have the first public participation portion. This is on agenda items only. So if you have any member of the public who has a comment on agenda items, you could state your name and address for the board and you would have five minutes. So I've just done the mass unmute all. So anybody who wants to unmute should be able to. Is anybody else's computer freezing? Mm -mm. No. I must have a bad connection because it, it, everybody keeps freezing on my computer. You seem a little delayed, like your lips aren't matching your words. Right. If I disconnect and reconnect, will that fix that mic? Uh, it may. Should I try to do that? Yeah, you can. And we'll just okay. wait. Wait. No, no, we'll just wait. Okay. All right. There's my... Again. Again, if there's anyone wishing to address the board, you could do that now while, while Michelle's trying to get her connection improved. I can't even get my mouse to move now. You're coming through on our end, Michelle. I don't know if what you're seeing, but you're coming yeah. through on our end. It's gone. Disconnected, so technically we just need to hold right here before we do anything further. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even public participation kind of needs to be held up a little bit. All right, we'll take a pause. Roger, I muted you. If you want to do public participation, when we open it back up, you can unmute yourself.
Here comes Michelle. <clears throat> There we go. Hi. Hi. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. We should be good to continue, Sean. All right, so we'll open it up one last time here under the first public participation uh, for agenda items only. Anyone wishing to address the board has the ability to unmute themselves. Please do so if you would like to address the board. Uh, I see nothing, Sean. All right. Do you want to go ahead and mute everyone again, and then we'll get moving on to the next agenda item? <clears throat> Just take a second. <clears throat> um, I think I got everybody should be able to unmute themselves. All right. Michelle. Perfect. All right, so we'll move on to <clears throat> board member reports. I'm going to start this evening. Um, we've had a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of discussion online about the um, idea that we're, as a school district, going to be receiving some federal funds that are stimulus money. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that because some folks have raised the question, why are you running a levy when you're going to get potentially a million dollars or more in stimulus money? So I want to talk about what we're allowed to use that money for, just as an overview. The first thing is that we have to spend at least 20% of that money on what they call amelioration of learning loss. That basically means we have to offer some types of programs that we don't currently run to help our students catch up from gaps in their learning that have been created because of the pandemic. So that's not going to help us balance our budget by offering additional programs. It's a good thing to do. It's very helpful, but it's not going to help us balance our budget. We can also spend money on personal protective equipment. We didn't need personal protective equipment prior to the pandemic. Certainly we needed cleaning supplies and standard things that we do to disinfect the building and, and keep it clean, but that's not what that money's for. The other option is we can spend it on facility upgrades. This is, these are things like, upgrading your ventilation system to filter out COVID particles. <clears throat> Again, not something we can use to balance our budget. Things to, as, as far as facility upgrades, the other suggestion is things to help with social distancing. That might mean plastic dividers <laughs> between desks or those sort of things. <clears throat> Doesn't help us balance our budget. I know I keep saying it, but that's the point I'm trying to drive home. After school activities, that's another thing that we can offer to improve student success. Those are things we don't currently provide summer learning programs. We don't provide that now. So this, people have heard that we might get a million, we might get two. We don't know what the number is yet, <clears throat> but whatever money we get has to be used for those things. We can't just say, we're gonna put it into our general fund and that money will offset our deficit <clears throat> that we have in our five-year forecast. And therefore we could delay the levy by a year or two. Well, we can't do that because this money has to be used for these specific areas. There's also been discussion that the governor has proposed to increase funding for schools. That's true, he has. That's a proposal. That's his wish list. That's not the final number. We won't know that number until probably July. And he has to get that through the Senate. He has to get it through the House of Representatives at the state level. So it, it's, it doesn't work. It, it works very similarly to your federal government. When President Biden proposes something, he has to get the Senate and the House to approve it in order to have a budget. <clears throat> um, just a couple other facts I wanted to point out. Our cost per pupil in this district 
is the lowest in Lake County as far as what we spend per pupil. Our tax rate for our citizens is the second lowest in Lake County. The only reason it's the second lowest is because Perry has the Perry Nuclear Power Plant and they have a significant amount of revenue that they generate from that nuclear power plant. And that helps them not have to do things like most every other district in the state by running levies. Um, in the last 15 years, we've cut 41 teachers and 41 other staff members employed by the district. So we've certainly done the work to tighten our belt over the years, but you can only tighten it so far. And I just wanted to present some of that information tonight because I don't think that folks get all of that information or understand it. You read something in the paper, you hear about it, that we're gonna get a million dollars. Well, <throat> on an estimated $30 million budget, a million dollars is a lot of money if, so, if, if you or I got it, but it's not so much money when the school district gets it. Um, but we will make good use of it and we will follow the guidelines provided to us and make the very best use of the dollars we can to help our students. The last thing I wanted to say is that in the event we did get some more money, whether that be from the state or the federal government, <clears throat> this district basically runs on fumes. I mean, a normal governmental entity or a nonprofit is expected to have 30 to 90 days of cash in the bank to pay for bills because your, your, your funding fluctuates. Just like you at home probably get bills at different times and it's not always even. So we have to have money in the bank to pay for that. Mike can probably address this, but I think we have less than one day's cash on hand, maybe it's two days, but it's very, very small. And I've often said this, that if our treasurer decided to retire today, Madison would have a very difficult time trying to recruit a treasurer who would be willing to come to a district that lives on such razor margins. And the reason we do is because we try to make the best use of the dollars we have and get those to our students so that they can succeed. So I've just seen a lot of things on social media and I wanted to address some of those things from a board perspective. And, it, and I said it was the last thing, but it was the second last thing I'm gonna say. There's only five people in this community that can put a levy on the ballot. It's not our superintendent, it's not our treasurer, it's not our, it's not our teachers. There's five people that have a voice in saying yes or no. Those are your five elected school board members. All five of us live in Madison. So if there's going to be a tax increase, I'm paying it. Your, your various board members are going to see the same increase in their taxes that you would, depending on the size of your home or the, might say that much, much, much better than be the, your assessed value of your home. So I just think those were important things to point out. So I'll move on and see if there's any other board members who would like to give a report tonight. Thank you, Sean. Um, I think that you said a lot of, of what people needed to hear. Um, I'm, I don't see a tremendous amount of people uh, logged in tonight. So I'm hoping that many more will be watching this after the fact so that they can hear what you had to say because it is very important. It's very important for people to understand there are restrictions of regarding the COVID money that we're receiving that we can only spend it in certain areas. We can't, like you said, use it to balance the budget. Um, so I think that's very important. And I just hope that um, those of you that are watching, um, please share this with your friends so that people can understand a little bit better. I've heard a lot, a lot, a lot of people or have read on social media. Many people that spend um, you know, it, it, sadly, most people don't understand school financing. It's very difficult to understand, um, but most people don't ask questions. So when they're hollering mismanagement of funds, they really have no idea where we spend our money, what we spend it on, how much we spend. They've never looked at a treasurer's report. They've never met with our treasurer. We have a treasurer who, oh, loves numbers and loves to explain all of this to people. I mean, he really enjoys that. So he would be more than willing to answer any of those questions that any of the community members have. So please, the people that are watching this, share this information. And I encourage anyone who does think that there's mismanagement involved, 
please look into it. Don't blindly scream mismanagement. Look into it, see where our money goes, and then make an educated decision. Yeah, well, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Sean. You know, we are Madison. We're in this together. We want our community to thrive and succeed and our schools to be strong. And so we want with an attitude of civility and respect, we welcome your questions. Uh, we, we want a um, that kind of atmosphere, not an us against them at it. We're, we're in this together. So, so come, um, participate, ask questions, know the facts, and I think we'll be stronger because of it. As a new school board member, you know, I rest assure everyone that, uh, you know, Mike, everyone on the board, Angela, David, everybody does their best to uh, be fiscally responsible. And that uh, as Pastor Mike and everyone have said that, I mean, at the end of the day, we all have skin in the game and uh, we got to work together to have strong schools and, you know, support all the kids, no matter what they're going to do after high school, that we're supporting them effectively and, and, and this will do it. So thank you. And lastly, I'd like to say that what Sean and every and all my fellow board members have said, I 100% support. Um, I have four generations that have gone through Madison schools. Um, my dad, myself, my kids, my grandkids, I'm invested in this community. And I hope that you all are too. And I, and we do our homework. We, we look at everything and at every angle. Everyone said how Mike, our treasurer, looks at everything. It's absolutely the truth. We are transparent. We will answer any question you have, but this is for the good of the community and our kids. So it, it, we take it very seriously and we support it 100%. So I hope you all will too. And I just wanted to mention one last thing. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to drag out the board member reports, um, but we all understand that times are difficult right now. We really do. Um, and none of us uh, on the board, I can assure you, none of us are wealthy people. We will all be feeling um, the same financial impact that you feel. Um, we believe strongly that it is what is necessary to keep our school district, to keep offering what we do offer to our kids. Lord knows I would love to offer them more because we've cut so much over the years. Um, if you if you like what we offer to our kids, if you like that they get band and they get choir and they get shop class, which is, you know, woods. Um, I, back in my day, it was called shop class. Um, and you like the programs that we offer. It costs money, and we, in order to continue to offer those things to these kids, and hopefully offer them more, you know, this is what we feel that we need to do. And um, we understand that things are difficult, but we also feel that we have to give the community the chance to have their voice heard and for them to decide, for you all to decide what you want your schools to look like. All right, anyone all right. else? Okay, we'll move on to reports and recommendations of the treasurer. Thank you. First, I appreciate the kind words, but you know, in this district, it's truly a joint effort to keep the budget in line. I mean, Angela working with the staff, Dave working with federal programs and, and Jen working with special ed. If, if, you know, if any one of us four isn't working towards the same common goal, we are on, as, as Sean said, such a shoestring budget that it just won't work. So, you know, and it's the board supporting the programs we have and the programs that we can't have because of budget constraints that allows us to keep operating with the, the funds that we have. So that, that was the first thing I want to say. It's, it's thank you, but it, it is truly a joint effort in this district. Um, second, I just want to address one comment that, you know, th there's a lot of comments out on Facebook and 
Sean, you addressed the biggest one of why don't we have this third round of stimulus money in the forecast? And, you know, I can stop with the, with the first question of how much are we getting? I mean, it's, it's an impossible, irresponsible, reckless to pick a number and put it in a forecast when it's not based on any formal allocation. Um, and as we sit here today, I have no idea what we'll be getting and when we'll get it. Um, the second round is available, but you know, if we're spending the money, we can't get the cash because they, the state's run out of cash already on that allocation, and they're waiting for more from the federal government. So to do anything other than what we've done, um, I think would be irresponsible and disingenuous with our taxpayers saying that we have revenue coming in when we don't know, in fact, that we will. Um, and the other item I want to address real quick is I saw a comment that the renewal levy was not in the forecast. It is. Um, the, the, the forecast form that we use is the one that's set forth by the state of Ohio. And it says, when you have a levy that expires during the five-year forecast period, you have to remove it from the first line, which is real estate tax revenue. And you have to move it down to the second page where there is the renewal levies. Any ending balance that I've given this board in the 10 years I've been here includes the renewal levy revenue. Um, I, I think, again, it's reckless until we get our individual levies that have been um, defeated by the renewals that have been defeated by the voters to not include that in our planning. Um, our voters have supported the renewal levies that the Madison School has put on um, on their own. Um, but in answer to the question, when was the last time a renewal levy failed? It was um, November of 2019 when the Joint Financing District failed. It failed in two out of the four districts, Madison being one of them. So to answer, because I'm not a big fan of just going back and forth on Facebook, um, I get paid to do my talking at a board meeting and as a um, treasurer in a district. If anybody has questions, I spend an hour on the phone with a taxpayer on um, Thursday. I spent another half an hour on the phone with a gentleman. Uh, it was either Sunday or yesterday. Um, you know, give me a call. I'll, I'll spend as much time as it takes to answer your questions. We may not agree on my answers, but I'll tell you why I do things the way I do them. Um, and again, you can disagree with it and some people do, but we have a pretty good track record in this, in this district of being right on where, where we say we're going to be regardless of the things that are thrown at us. You cut us a half million, you give us 350,000 and we're just about where we need to be. We, we always make it work, but the deficit that's looming is not manageable. And that's why um, we went to the board and asked them to consider a levy. And that's why this board put a levy on. It's not to, it's not to add programs, it's to maintain what we have. And you know that's, that's enough. So um, I do have a couple, a few other things I wanna talk about. First, the audit for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020 is finally complete. Um, part of what held it up is that CARES money we got in May. So we get the money in May, we spend it in June of 2020, the state and the federal government released the testing guidelines in February of 21. So um, we spent it according to the way we're supposed to, but that held the audit up. Again, there were no issues, no verbal comments, no written management letter comments. The only comment they have is the same one that they've had the 10 years I've been here. And when Ed was here before, we don't file our um, financial statements on the generally accepted accounting principles, which is um, it'll cost us more to convert the statements to GAAP. It's the accrual basis. It's what most businesses file on. Um, but in a district like ours, cash is king. Um, you know, we're able to issue debt with a cash basis. We're able to do everything we need to do. <clears throat> it saves us seven grand a year. So um, unless this board has a reason why we would want to go to a GAAP statement or all of a sudden we can't get funding because of a non-GAAP statement, I would, even as a CPA, I would say, let's continue doing the GAAP, the non-GAAP statement. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, can y'all see that? That is the new bus we received, I believe two weeks ago. We ordered it in July. It takes that long. It takes eight months to get a bus built. Um, 
cost of that bus was $86,422. Good news is, for the first time in a long time, the state put money in to help us pay for a bus. So roughly half, $43,280 of that bus is being paid for through a grant with the state. So that's, um, that's a big deal because they haven't had the bus uh, funds available for many, many years. So that, that's a good thing. You know, we should be buying two or three a year. We bought uh, a new one last year. We bought a new one this year. And we just took uh, delivery of two used buses for, from the Orange School District in uh, Pepper Pike. We buy used buses from other districts because we don't have enough funding to buy, you know, three or four new ones every year, two or three new ones. So we buy used ones that we can get four years out of, and then we scrap them. So, and we'll continue to do that because that's what, that's what we do. And then the final thing is, um, as, as the board knows, both Madison Township and Madison Village have zones that either redirect um, part of the real estate tax to a fund. It's called a tax increment financing. It's a fund that pays for infrastructure for um, that allows businesses to be able to operate, or it just flat out abates them to attract uh, new businesses to, to the community. This chart, this chart shows what, um, what we lost in the last tax year because of either the TIF zones or the abatement zones. Um, as you see, the two hotels here, they're in an abatement zone. So those aren't, I believe, going to help infrastructure. But it did attract two major pieces of business to, or you know, business entities to this district, which helps the community. Um, this amount will continue to grow as more businesses are, are developed in those properties. For example, I believe Verizon, the new store will be, is, is in, that, in that zone. Um, and there are some others that, you know, I, I am not sure with all four corners of 90 and 528, whether all of those will be in an abatement zone. But my guess is, is they will be since, you know, that's why I think the major um, Great Lakes power is, is coming to town. So just to let you know, when you, just because you see new development, new buildings and new businesses in the district doesn't always mean a, a large increase in revenue for the district. Mike, for clarification, for example, on the hotels, we do get some tax money. That's, That's correct. just the, we could have gotten more tax money had it not been in the abatement. Yes. Um, if you look at, at the, the bottom, the second to the right column, mm -hmm. you know, we, we got, I, I think the 109,000 is for us. Um, so we got, that minus 45,000. So we did get an increase, um, but certainly not as much as we would sure. have gotten um, if it wasn't abated, so. And how many years does that abatement last? Do you know? I, I, wanna, I wanna say 10, cause I think they, you know, the village is trying to generate business to-, to Oh, absolutely. Help. So I think they went the max on that and we may have extended the abatement another few years at a much smaller percentage. Oh yeah, I do recall that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mike, I have one question. Is this just for the last tax year? Because isn't Laurentia on that too? So I asked about that. Um, and they said it was, it was, see the way an abatement works is from the day they file to have it either abated or included in the TIF, it's the increase in the property value from that date on. And Laurentia was already built. And, and that was part of my complaint when they did that. I said, this is a huge entity that's already been built. How do you tiff that? Or how do you abate that? Um, and it was not, it, it must not have been included because okay. that was the glaring error when I saw it. I said, what happened to Laurentia? Cause that is, they put major money into that development. So. Well, and I remember they brought it forward to us too. So yeah. I wanted yeah. to and get some clarification. It, yeah, and the, the both the village and the township do make us aware when we're doing this, um, and I we do I do sit on the tax incentive review committee, and you know there are others coming that'll be partially abated, but you know 
You can also look at it as would Great Lakes Power come if they weren't getting a tax break? Only they can answer that question. So is half of something better than all of nothing? Any other questions on that before I go into the items on the agenda? Okay, so the first is, let me explain it first. Um, you've already passed the resolution to transfer the money. We had a transposition error. It was $360 instead of the 630. So when I would, went to do the transfer, we were, we were short $360 um, or 270. So the first is correct the transfer amount in resolution number 209-20 to $36,630.70. Move. A second. Any discussion? Roll call. Brian Horvath? Yes. Gene Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Vote is 5 0. Hang on, I want to check something. Somebody had come in late. I want to make sure they got in. Okay, they did. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The next is a resolution accepting the amounts as, and rates as determined by the Budget Commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to the county auditor. I'll move. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Gene Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Ryan Horvath? Yes. Vote is 5-0. And finally, um, to approve the following donations, a generous donation of $200 from Allison White to the Madison Middle School fundraiser Cash for Canines, and a generous donation of cookies from Angela Smith and Sean Douglas of cookies to be used for National Honor Society induction ceremony. Oh, typo. Yeah, it's okay. That's what I do when I don't have an assistant available. The cookies must have been good. We've mentioned them twice. <laughs> I'll move. I'll second. Any discussion? Thank you very much for your generous donations to everyone that donated. Thank you. I ate my son's cookie. <laughs> it's confessions. Take it off your donation. <laughs> See your priest. <laughs> There was actually more than one, but I did eat one. <laughs> Roll call. <laughs> I'm sorry, I coughed. Did you say call the roll? I said roll call, yes. Okay, sorry. I was Sean Douglas? Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Ryan Horvath? Yes. Gene Sensi? Yes. Vote is 5-0. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Reports of the administrative team. All right. Well, I want to start by uh, reminding everybody that it is our second vaccination day on Friday. Um, so it will be an asynchronous, which means students will be working without the direction of a teacher remote learning day on Friday. Elementaries are doing the work that gets sent home. Um, students in middle school and high school will log into their Google classrooms for their assignments. Um, and they need to complete their assignments and have them completed by the time we return from spring break. Uh, I, by Good Friday, those who have been vaccinated in our clinics will be considered fully vaccinated. So that's a good thing. It's a very good thing. Um, I wanted to take some time too to talk a little bit about uh, our stimulus funds and what, uh, we plan to do with some of those funds, especially as they become more defined. But uh, we have to plan for summer intervention um, after school programming for the next school year. Um, and we are working with the uh, Educational Service Center to coordinate that programming as well as offer our own programs. We're going to be sending a survey to our staff to gauge their interest in what they would like to see and do uh, in regards to various in-house programs. 
Um, and as Sean said at the beginning of the meeting, with the new uh, rounds of funding, we will have to allocate 20% of that to address learning loss. Um, in addition to uh, what we had already planned to allocate from our ESSER II funds. So our team has been talking uh, internally, they've been talking with staff, we've been talking with people from the ESC to start generating those ideas, and we will be putting our uh, plans together. Uh, and it, please note that it's a document that's going to change over time. So even though the governor said April 1st, you have to have your plans due, uh, any plan worth assault is going to change a little bit over time. We're gonna have some general ideas of what we're going to do. We're going to flesh those out and develop them more. Um, and you know, transportation could be a part of that. So there, there are costs associated with that. So there's, you know, you've got to consider all the costs when running a program. It's not just uh, paying for the staff, but all the materials that you need and all of those things. So we will be breaking those programs down and, and using those dollars uh, very responsibly to support our students because, you know, I'm going to share here in a, a little bit uh, where we're at in some of our demographics. And I think that is uh, important for the community to understand. But any questions about any more on these ESSER funds? I would anticipate within the next month, we'll have an idea what the allocations will be and uh, what the application process will be and what we'll be doing. All right, well, Mike, you wanna put the chamber presentation up for me. I thought I would take um, this evening, on Friday I did a little state of the schools uh, presentation with other members, school districts of the Eastern Lake County. So I thought I would share um, our part of the presentation with, with the board and the community tonight, because I think it's important to understand that we work very hard with the resources we have to build um, collaborations. And we have some teachers doing some very innovative things. And I'm just highlighting a couple tonight and we'll be highlighting some more things as we go through the next couple of board meetings. But uh, I think this is a good starting point. So if we look at our demographics, our enrollment currently as of last week stands at 2,833 students in pre-K to uh, 12. Um, our student demographics are, we are, you know, mostly white. We have Hispanic, we have multiracial, African American, and Asian Pacific Islander to round out those demographics. Um, I think a key demographic is our economically disadvantaged is at 48.5%. Our limited English proficiency is 2% and our students with disabilities is 15.8%. And one of the things I think that's important in looking at those demographics are, those are the resources, especially for these summer interventions and those programs that, you know, these, these students need extra supports. And these are the things that we have to do. And we use every dollar and every resource that we have through federal programs to help support that. And our um, ESSER monies will help that as well. So I think these are key, key numbers to look at, along with, it's already been stated tonight, but I think it got, you can't say it too many times, we are the lowest in revenue per pupil in Lake County, and we are the lowest in expenditures per pupil in Lake County. And I've said this numerous times, and I said in the presentation on Friday, our staff has learned to do a whole lot for our students with little, and they do an outstanding job. Since the, I, the idea behind the presentation was connections and partnerships, um, I wanted to talk about some of those programs that we have offered and, and continue to work with different people. Project Lead the Way is in our um, pre-engineering program at the high school. We still offer new, multiple sections of that throughout the year along with the woods. The, that teacher does dual duty. Uh, we have a strong collaboration with the Alliance for Working Together and our robotics teams. I think this year we have two robotics teams uh, competing in the 
RoboBots competition, which is scheduled for the end of April. Uh, we have an ecology club that partners with local nurseries. We have always had a very strong partnership with Rabbit Run Theater uh, and the Madison Public Library. Madison Public Library, we help support the Bookmobile. Um, they have worked with us on Little Engineers program uh, and they are helping us to structure a kindergarten boot camp. Um, we have numerous, numerous community partnerships to support student recognition programs and you can see them all over uh, various school uh, and PTO websites. And we do look at shared services to save costs. Uh, you know, we share our nutrition services director with multiple districts as well as our technology team is part of a shared services model. So we're constantly looking at ways to collaborate and save dollars. Um, with that, we look to provide programs to support students at all levels. Uh, we, at our high school, we have a career field experience through the can, uh, Family and Consumer Science Program and they go out and they partner with uh, various um, businesses to job shadow and do a presentation and report. Obviously last year that did not happen. Um, I am not sure exactly with all the COVID <laughs> protocols what our staff, our students will be able to do this year. Uh, Career-based intervention program to support at-risk students and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. We have a career technical education technology course at Madison Middle School um, taught through uh, their electives on a nine week program. Uh, we have numerous advanced placement and college credit plus courses offered at Madison High School. Uh, we have partnered with uh, the state support team and Martha Holden Jennings to offer the same early literacy opportunities for both North and South Elementary. And I think, you know, the amount of work that goes into uh, step up to quality and having a five star step up to quality pre K is also quite an accomplishment, which means we're doing the things we need to do for our students to succeed. Uh, I like to look at what kinds of things are going on in our uh, buildings. And I'm going to focus in some high school programs today. It's the outside the box thinking that teachers bring to the table because they're the ones doing the work each and every day. We have a couple teachers at the high school, Tim Pira and Kelly Chandler, who have come up with the, this idea of a salsa garden. So they've taken a space along uh, a side of Madison High School and have turned it into a salsa garden. And they actually then every year uh, make salsa. And because I was uh, technologically challenged last week, I don't actually have a picture of the salsa bottles that they have done, but there's a uh, fish um, uh, bottle of salsa. And then I think there's another bottle of salsa that they, they make an extra hot and they make a more mild uh, uh, salsa or so, hot sauce. So they do a whole lot of different things. Um, another part in the front of the high school, uh, Kelly's students made a uh, monarch garden. And um, I think she's writing up something uh, for recognition with that, with her, span, with her, her students having um, put Spanish translations out there. Um, so I think there's a lot of very unique things going on. If you wanna, can you hit to the next one, Mike? Just, uh, that's the kids actually making the, the salsa. Um, and that was the last, you know, some of it was done pre-COVID. Some of it, I think they tried to do in the fall uh, when we returned. Another thing that our, our students did, Spanish students did was for Day of the Dead, uh, they designed these skulls and then they were put on display at Wild Burrito. So, you know, we, they look for unique partnerships. I think something that we're really proud of is, and this was in conjunction with a, a grant a donation from Carmuse, um, and our, the class of 2020 is the outdoor classroom. 
And then we will be using the broadband uh, connectivity grant to add that wireless outside. So students will be able to use this space with their Chromebooks outside. And again, another very creative way of doing things. Um, our outside the box thinking also to promote unique collaborations has been our career-based intervention program. We know that when students get to high school, those at most at risk of dropping out need that extra little push. And the push is in the relationships they build. And then you build those relationships with your teachers, your administrators, using the blended learning model. They do classwork, they have jobs, and they do in-school work around the buildings and they've been partnering with the science and Spanish classes as well. And um, Brian Kramer has also worked to get some community sponsors for incentives. So these are just some of those ways that we in Madison promote those unique collaborations because we don't have that large business population. We have nurseries, we have restaurants. We do not have the manufacturing sector that some of my colleagues have to find those unique partnerships. But we are trying to do some of that outside the box thinking. And um, I think another key point is that we really do appreciate every community partnership that we have, whether it's through our student recognition programs, where we're like I said, we have a lot of people that support our students for various programs, uh, or the resources that they give us or the experiences they provide. These things all help our students. Um, another, I think, and this is where I'm going to bring Gretchen in to the fold here, because Gretchen got some news today that I asked her to share uh, at tonight's meeting about one of the teachers, uh, Mr. Pira. And then you can go ahead and, because I'm going to transition into uh, bring activities, you could talk about your uh, senior idea there that you have going. Okay. okay. Hi, my name is Gretchen Bapti and I am the president of the Madison Education Association. I'm also a third grade teacher at North Elementary. Uh, we received some wonderful news today. Um, I just emailed our membership to let them know. Um, <clears throat> Tim Pira at the high school um, had applied. Um, he had entered to win a contest um, NEOEA, Northeastern Ohio Education Association, hosts a green school award competition annually um, for schools in the Northeastern Ohio region. Uh, Tim has applied, I want to say this might be his third year applying, and I got word today that he actually won the contest. Um, so he is going to be receiving um, some financial support through that for um, his many amazing programs that he does for our students at the high school. Um, they were actually, they reached out to me, um, some of the NEOEA leadership and said that they were so impressed with what he is doing that they are um, hoping to maybe encourage him to present for NEOEA um, to teachers in the entire region. They were so impressed with his work. So um, we were really excited about that news today. Um, also, our executive team for MEA met last week and um, we wrote a grant as an education association and got um, approximately $2,000 in funding. And our executive team has decided that we want to use that grant funding to do something to honor this year's graduating class. Uh, we realized that they have really been through a lot and this has been a different year for all of them. And so we are going to, in the next um, month or month and a half, be rolling out an adopt a senior program where our um, members, our teachers in the district will adopt a senior or two from the senior class. And we will present um, each of those seniors with a yard sign um, just to celebrate them as seniors, as well as a little um, goodie, care package um, 
we're still in the early stages of sort of ironing out the details, but we're excited to be able to use this grant opportunity to partner with the, the community and the kids and um, really let them know that, you know, the teachers really care about the kids and we support them and we know it's been a, a not so traditional year and we want them to know that we're here for them. Congratulations. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the, uh, what the MEA is going to do for this year's graduating class because it has been a unique year. Um, are there any questions on the chamber presentation before I move on to the big announcements? I don't have any questions on that, but I do see that they are collecting um, sap from the trees outside. Okay. They are. Um, and I noticed you hadn't mentioned anything about that. The syrup. There's just so many things to remember. Yes, they, they are doing the syrup project again. They do that every year. Um, that's one of uh, another one of Mr. Pira's projects. Uh huh. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to, uh, I don't know where to set up, you know, put my name on the list to buy a bottle of this, but I uh, seem to always be too late every year. It's all, it sells out as quick as he makes it. I will, I will let him know. And I think there, there might be somebody online that might let him know as well. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, we, we have come to a point in our planning that I think we can make some announcements tonight that will go out to the community uh, in an update tomorrow regarding um, some big activities. Um, I start this part of the meeting though this evening just saying that all events that I'm talking about are subject to change depending on what happens with this virus. Right now we're in a really good trend. We are in a, a, a trend where things are relatively stable, They're, they've gone down, people are getting vaccinated, um, but it can take one event that could cause a super spreader. So I, I'm just putting it out there that as of things right now, we are going to have a senior prom. Usually it's a junior senior prom, but we are going to have a senior prom. All right, because of the social distancing requirements and the numbers that we can have at our party center, Normandy Party Center, um, the advisors, Mr. Fisher, myself, uh, Mr. Bull, we, we all talked about it. And um, a senior prom is going to happen on May 1st from 6 to 10 p.m. Now, this is where things are a little different because we are living in a COVID world. Seniors may invite a date from Madison High School, but we talked at length about outside dates. And here's just one reason why we're being very cautious, because as Mr. Fisher has said in an email to his coaches and very well, else, our main goal is to keep schools open, to get to the end of the year and to have graduation. Prom. If we bring in outsiders, because most of my experience with this virus this year has been with outside events, outside people, not our own students, but outside youth sports, outside when our players went to, um, were exposed through a basketball game. So we are going to keep it in-house. Seniors may bring a date from Madison High School, so they may invite a junior a sophomore or a freshman, but they can't bring that college date back because colleges right now are also a place that the virus is spreading. I, you know, if you listen to the news, Duke just shut down for uh, a couple weeks because they've had a ma major outbreak. So we want to keep everybody safe. We want to give them that experience and have a good time. There will be dancing. Students will have to wear masks um, because those are under the current health orders. Now, if health orders change, we are, are willing to look at those guidelines changing, but we 
are excited to announce that we are going to have a senior prom. So girls can go out and start buying those dresses over spring break. That's why we wanted to make sure this news gets out there because we know that's prime shopping time. Um, the other big event obviously is graduation. Uh, with our normal graduation of 2000 people in the high school gym, nobody, wherever the course of this virus goes, feels comfortable with that idea. We also know that our, our own uh, football stadium would take a little bit of work. Um, so we are going to have graduation at Canton Stadium um, on May 22nd. They are working with us with a, for a very reasonable rate and we have some lake health funds that we have had for several years that will allow us to um, make this happen and they are gonna work with us to make this very special. I do not have the time at this point because we also wanna make sure that it's not, it probably won't be the normal time that we're at, that's on the announcements only because we want it to be a little bit warmer in the day and sun out because we know May can be a little chilly. So, but we have uh, secured that date with Captain Stadium for May 22nd. So we're very excited about these two things. Uh, Fifth grade activities have also been announced. We are going to do the Olympics. We're going to do a picnic and we're going to do a clap out. Specific details are being worked out. Um, but again, it will be some of the things other than the clap out will be very limited in scope to outsiders, meaning parents were, were trying to work some of those details out. But I, again, the whole idea is to keep the spread down and numbers low. Um, we are looking at awards programs at Madison High School. They're currently being planned. More details to come. I know I've gotten a lot of inquiries about sports awards uh, and some of the winter sports teams wanting to have their parents. We are asking them to put those on hold for two weeks uh, after spring break and then come back and, and have them and we could possibly have parents. My concern right now is, is if we announce dates that week after spring break and then we get a surge, that can be a problem. So we're just trying to be very methodical as we've been throughout this virus um, in looking at where the trends are. But the trends right now are very good. And so we need to do some planning and I'm excited to announce those things this evening. What was the date of prom again, Angela? May 1st from 6 to 10 p.m. Thank you. Any questions? No, no, I just wanna thank you, Angela. I know that you and your team have been working really hard um, since the beginning of this pandemic. And I know that you work extremely long hours, day after day after day as a result of everything that has been going on. And I know that, you know, just adding one or two more things to your plate is, your plate is already overflowing. So thank you very much for, you know, making these plans, figuring them out so that we can, so that our kids can celebrate and, yeah. You know, sadly, we can't go back to, to last year, but I'm glad that this year's seniors are going to have a prom. And uh, certainly I'm, I'm, I'm excited about graduation at Captain Stadium, actually. I'm really excited about graduation at Captain Stadium. I think that's a great place. So thank you for thinking of that. I have to give a credit where credit is due. Um, Ron Graham brought that idea to, and he's the Lake County, um, health director and he brought that idea to our superintendent's meeting and I was like I'm jumping on this and um, Jean with her connections through United Way helped to um, I think secure decent pricing for us and um, yeah I'm, I'm very excited for uh, Captain Stadium I think I've even got fish warmed up to it <laughs> because you know fish is a, a creature of habit and he, he's got that graduation ceremony in the gym down to a science. And I said, you're going to love not having to do all the little details. So 
Um, it's, it's, I'm excited for it. I just think it's so refreshing that we're even making plans. It's almost a sign of normalcy, you know, that, that things are going to get better. So I all positive, a lot of work, but it's paying off. Great job. Uh, team effort. Well, thank you, Jean, because I know I'm almost certain that we got that rate because of your connections with captains and all that. So very much appreciated. No I just problem. wanted to re rewind just a little bit because during Angela's report, uh, we talked about, and I know I say this all the time when this comes up, but that step up to quality rating that we have at that pre-K is a significant accomplishment. And, and Joe Vett Felton well, deserves a great deal of credit for that because there are so many, to, to, to break it down very simply is you have to meet a lot of credentialing in order to get those ratings. And it starts with star one and goes up to star five. And obviously we have the highest rating and there are child care centers that are for profit that are trying to get those ratings that don't have them. Yeah. And yet we do. So I, I know I comment on it when it comes up, it, it's because I'm aware of how much work it takes to get there. So I just wanted to give a compliment to her because that's, it's really a lot of work and a lot of accomplishments. So thank you. Um, Sean, if you don't mind, can you tell us a little bit about it? For those that uh, weren't on the meeting when they talked about the stepped up, when we, we you know, talked about the step up quality and her getting that, um, most people don't have any idea what that is. It's, it's credentialing of your school or your daycare center or whatever it is that you're providing where it involves children everything from safety related issues to staff ratios to um i, I mean it's, it's just sort of everything that goes involved with providing care to children and education to children that you have to get credentialed and it's a lot of hoops to jump through and you really have, you, there's no way to do a bad job when you're that credential. There just isn't because you're just graded on everything that you have to present. So I, I guess that's the short version of it. If, if that helps, I don't know if it's that mm -hmm. thorough, but um, you know, I just, where I work, we have to deal with those issues for our, our child care centers and our child care individual homes that provide child care in them that receive um, funding for subsidized child care in order to provide care, all have to go through that. And, and it's exhaustive. It really is exhaustive. I mean, your snack schedule has to be in compliance with all these guidelines. I mean, it's very over-regulated in some sense, but it, it's also exhaustive to make sure you're providing good care to children. And then on the pre-K side, they have to deal with education of children as well, not just taking care of them during the day, like a child care center would have to. Yeah, five-star rating generally just means you're doing everything right, according to all of the credentials. It's amazing. A lot, of good, a lot of hard work. Yeah. All right, so now that I got the big announcements and fun announcements, Dave gets to talk about the not-so-fun announcements <laughs> regarding testing. Sure. Well, I'm looking out my window and it's still daylight. Uh, so that means it's March and every educator knows that in March we take tests. Uh, it's what <laughs> we do. Um, so we're in the midst of that now. We have um, the, uh, it's called the Ohio English Language Proficiency Assessment. That's given to all of our students who are, have not yet reached proficiency in, in the English language. And that's, uh, that's a big undertaking being done by a very small staff and that, that happens uh, throughout this month and throughout February as well. Uh, yesterday and no, last, uh, last Thursday and today, we administered the ACT to our 11th graders. So that is a state-sponsored opportunity to take the ACT test. Results can be sent off to the universities of their choice. Um, it, it's kind of cool that the state has started doing this in recent years because some students, you know, to take the ACT, you schedule your appointment, you usually go somewhere off site, um, you pay your, your money to do it. And, um, you know, with all of our 11th graders getting the opportunity to do that, some may see, wow, I scored better than I thought I would. Maybe, maybe I will go on to college or give it a try. Um, so we were able to do that uh, this past week. 
um, with a lot of help from uh, <laughs> many people at the high school. Uh, our regular state tests for grades three through 12 will begin about the middle of April and go through about the middle of May. Uh, and the big change this year, because everything has to be different and everything has to be a challenge, um, is that we have a good number of our students who are still uh, learning virtually um, at home. The rule, uh, the requirement really based on technology and the ability to do it is students will have to come in person to take the tests. As a district, we strongly encourage our students to come in uh, and participate in any tests that are applicable to them. But we also respect um, families who may feel uncomfortable about sending their children into the, to the schools. They've kept them home, uh, learning at home through all of this. And if they're not comfortable sending them in, um, we respect that and the state allows us to um, not require that students come in and, and take the test. We're hoping that we get a good number of them that will come in. Uh, this year, because your percentage of students who actually come in and test is really gonna be variable from grade level to grade level, district to district, um, what we hope to get from these tests are some data on our students. And what does it look like after the year we've experienced? And how do we use that information to plan going forward um, for the next several years to try to close any gaps uh, that may exist. Um, the state thankfully has, uh, has relaxed a couple of our, our normal requirements you know, because of the crazy year we've had. Normally the third grade reading test is uh, used to determine whether or not a student moves from third grade to fourth grade. Uh, this year that is not the case. In fact, the, the wording is I'm um, paraphrasing, but it's no, no third grade students shall be retained based on their state ELA test. So that's, a, I think, a really responsible thing to do this year. Um, there will not be a, a overall report card grade for our district because, you know, it's, it's, it's been so disjointed and some students are in person, some students are home, some came and tested, some didn't come and test. Um, but uh, we are going to go through this process. Um, we're going to do it, uh, you know, as, as best we can and with fidelity and get as many of our students through it. And uh, about the middle of May, we can breathe a big sigh of relief. <laughs> so that's kind of where we are. It's how it looks a little bit different this year. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that um, anyone has. Cue the crickets. All right, we're ready for recommendations. We are. I just wanted to, hi, real quick. Um, this is Jen Grimes. I'm the pupil service director and one of the umbrellas that I work under is social emotional health. I apologize, I can't have my screen on. I'm not in the best place here uh, tonight. Uh, one new announcement that I have is that uh, our district was involved in a grant that was specifically designed for social emotional support. Uh, there were other districts involved and that was Perry and Painesville and I believe Kirtland. And what we've done uh, is partnered with Crossroads and that's a mental health, for those of you who don't know, a mental health uh, agency in Lake County that works in um, providing that mental health support through counseling. And we have a great partnership with them. Angela was great in um, working with uh, the county in order for us to get this grant. And she and I have worked uh, really closely with Crossroads to develop some of those programs. Uh, one of the things that uh, was part of this grant was developing a crisis intervention team. Another acronym is CIT. And that was uh, one thing that uh, came from that, that was a result of this grant was the day that we had asynchronous learning and for the vaccinations, all of the staff in Madison local schools, this includes our uh, support staff, and our uh, kitchen aides, everything had to go through uh, social, emotional, mental health uh, training. It was four 
uh, sections about how to support students in our district. Because again, it, it's not just limited to teachers. And as a result of that, of all of the other districts, and I just found this out today because our CIT team met, um, of all the other districts in this grant, Madison has been the most dedicated and has the most members of their staff who committed to this um, initiative. So I think that that is something um, to be celebrated and all of that training is going to be used uh, for the rest of the year. And then certainly next year in the unchartered waters of, of starting back with all of our students who we may not have seen. And so I think it's something that um, speaks to the dedication of the district and our district leadership team with Dave and Angela, myself, um, and being committed to supporting our students. Um, we also have the, the PBIS, um, which is all about supporting our students in, in the buildings. Shannon Kriegman, uh, Kriegman, sorry, uh, the South Elementary principal heads that up. And this initiative along with that really works uh, hand in hand. So I just wanted to celebrate again, and this is a partnership and this was all done through a grant, which you know takes time to, to put together and, and be a part of, and then to actually do with fidelity and commitment. So I just wanted everybody to know that, you know we are all as an entire staff for Madison going to be working with our students and, and trying to, to support them in the best way they can, not just through their education. So that's all I have. Thank you, Jen. That is good news. I mean, um, yeah, because we didn't have a chance to talk today at the end of the day. So that is awesome to hear that, you know, our staff really stepped up, did those modules. Um, and I know for some, those modules had some tough stuff in them. So, uh, you know, in dealing with trauma and all sorts of things that our kids are dealing with. It brings up things from people's own lives sometimes too. So um, big shout out to everybody for their efforts there. All right, ready to go? We're ready to go. All right. Um, under my recommendations tonight, I'm asking you to accept the following resignations. Uh, Brent Buell, mechanic, effective February 24th, 2021. To accept the resignation of Aaron Chambers, custodian, effective February 19th, 2021. To accept the resignation of Nick Mayer, Madison High School's boy JV tennis coach, effective March 5th, 2021. Uh, to approve the unpaid leave request of Kathy Sturm, uh, South Elementary, fourth grade teacher for the period of March 8th through March 12th. We're asking you to enter into the following employment contracts. Um, the following substitute teachers is approved by the Educational Service Center of the Western Reserve and or the Madison Local School District Superintendent. Um, Adam Brisky, Amanda Fortuna, and Taylor Petty. Uh, we're asking you to uh, employ the following <laughs> casual day-to-day -day substitute, uh, Julie O'Brien, to employ Asia Rundeck under a long-term substitute teacher contract from February 1st, 2021 through May 27th, 2021 to perform the duties of Sher Sherry Maracek, um, to employ Nick Nicole Shimko as a cashier at South Elementary School, effective March 1st, 2021, to employ Roy Norris as a custodian, second shift at Madison High School, um, effective March 8th, 2021, to employ Amanda Fortuna as a building substitute at North Elementary School, effective February 22nd, 2021, and to employ the following certificated personnel under a one-year limited supplemental contract, and that would be Shane Hamilton, MHS ninth grade baseball coach. And that's the personnel motion this evening. I move. I'll second. I'll second. Any discussion? Obviously appreciate Julie O'Brien's uh, work in our central office recently, helping our superintendent. I know that's not what she's on the agenda for tonight, but just thought I would say it. 
Any other discussion? Roll call. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Brian Horvath? Brian, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Gene Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Vote is 5 0. All right. And um, <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is an annual um, renewal of our commitment to continue the policy of interdistrict and intra district open enrollment. And that is in policy, board policies 5113 and 5113.01. I'll move. I'll second. Any discussion? Roll call. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Brian Horvath? Yes. Gene Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Vote is 5 0. And the next item is the resolution recognizing and honoring the students selected for the Madison chapter of the National Honor Society. I'll move. I'll, I'll second. second. Any discussion? Congratulations to all of our inductees in the National Honor Society. We're very proud of you. Roll call. Brian Horvath? Yes. Dean Sensi? Yes. John Douglas? Yes. Michael Howry? Yes. Michelle Hayes? Yes. Vote is 5 0. Right. And the next item on the agenda is um, similar to one we've done before, but it relates specifically to the new House bill. And this is a resolution to endorse the Fair School Funding Plan is contained in House Bill 1 and encouraged the 134th General Assembly to expedite the passage of the bill. I'll move. I'll second. Any discussion? I would like to just note that this is one of several things that uh, are being asked of us by the various organizations. I think you might have seen something um, from o the Ohio School Boards Association. I know my organization has sent something out, but regionally there are people that have been working with the legislature on this um, bill doing testimony. They are also organizing regional meetings with our state senator and our, our local representatives and um, are asking superintendents, treasurers, and uh, if the board presidents want to attend, they can attend as well. So um, just want to share that information because they're trying to get uh, <coughs> press the urgency of getting this bill finally into law. I'll move. I will second. Any discussion? Um, we already had a motion and a second on that. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry. All right. Roll call. Gene Sensi. Yes. John Douglas. Yes. Michael Howry. Yes. Michelle Hayes. Yes. Ryan Horvath. Yes. Vote is 5 0. There are no items on the consent calendar this evening. All right, so we will have our second public participation portion. This is on any item uh, anyone wishes to address with the board. Uh, anyone wishing to address the board would have five minutes to do so. If you could state your name and address, please. Uh, if I've done it correctly, everyone should be able to unmute themselves. And it looks like Joe can. Hello. Hello. I'm Audra Wisnowski, 2760 Haynes Road, Madison, Ohio. I just uh, wanted to tell you all how appreciative I am of all of you and the hard work that you're doing for our community and for our children. Um, it doesn't go unnoticed. Um, you have more support than you realize. I know social media is pretty crazy and there's a lot of negative 
comments, but usually you'll just see the negative and not so much the positive, but you know that you guys have a lot of support behind you and I really appreciate you all. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, Audra. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address the board? Yeah, Joe Vulcan here. Hi, Joe. Joe Vulcan, 7294 Ross Road. Uh, Hi, Joe. Are, are we contemplating getting any money from the, the government here on this uh, COVID relief thing? Um, sure, you might, have, um, you might have logged in just a little bit late. Um, because Sean reviewed that in the beginning, but I think it's probably a great idea for Sean to review that again, uh, because we are getting some, but there are some stipulations to how we're able to use that. Sean, did you want to go over that again? Sure, if I could find that piece of paper where I wrote the notes here. Basically, we can't yes. use it to balance our budget, Joe, and, but he'll go over more of that specifically as soon as he finds his paper. I got my papers. All right, so... Okay. We don't know how much money we're gonna get as stimulus money. There's talk that it could be a million dollars or more. Um, that money is all earmarked for very specific things. So the first thing is, I'm gonna to try to say this word right again, amelioration of learning loss. We have to spend at least 20% of our funds on that. So these are programs that we don't currently offer that are designed to help our students uh, close the gap and catch up from gaps created because of the difference in education during COVID versus pre-COVID. Uh, the second thing that we can spend our money on is personal protective equipment. Those are things that we did not have to buy prior to COVID. So that doesn't help us with our budget. Um, certainly we bought disinfectant and cleaners, but that was that's not personal protective equipment. Those are masks and things like that. Um, the next thing we're allowed to spend our money on is facility upgrades, specifically those related to ventilation systems and social distancing. So we could buy a more advanced ventilation system that filters out um, particles that related to COVID and also do things sort of to the equivalent of putting up plastic barriers between desks so that um, students aren't having respiratory particle projection, basically when you breathe out, uh, going from one student to another. We can do after school activities uh, with that money. Those are things that we don't currently provide. And lastly is summer learning programs that we don't currently provide. So although we may get an influx of money, it's not anything that we can just throw into our general fund and say, all right, now we have, let's assume for the moment that we're going to get a million dollars. It's not something where we can say, okay, now we have an additional million dollars. So that means we can delay our levy by six months or a year or however long that would buy us. We have to spend it in these particular areas. So it's very earmarked dollars. Uh, there's also been discussion that the governor um, has proposed additional revenue to schools, which is true but that's just a proposal that has to be worked out between the Senate and the House Representatives at the state level. And so we are, we have no information about that. We will probably not learn anything about these until July or later perhaps, um, at least at the state level. Um, that's usually when the budget at the, the state fiscal year is usually July 1st to June 30th, but oftentimes things aren't resolved until slightly after that. So we don't have all that information. I don't know if that helps, Joe, but that's what I think you were asking. Yeah, partly. Uh, maybe go over this again. Why do we really need this increase? I mean, are we spending more now than we were before or what? I, I don't know. Well, the short version is that we have been flat funded from the state for a significant period, of, significant period of time. Over 15 years, we've laid off 41 teachers, 41 other staff members. Inflation goes up every year and the costs just continue to rise. When we ran the levy that, the only levy that we passed in 30 years for new money or additional money is, was passed about five years ago, four years ago. And we 
told the um, community that it would last us about as long as it has. And so when the state continues to basically tell communities, we're gonna flat fund you and inflation's gonna go up, you need to make up the difference by going to your community and offering levies. The average levy is offered by a school district in the state of Ohio about every four years. So in Madison, we went almost, we went 27 years before we passed one. So what we did was we just slowly cut, 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 cut. And eventually you can't cut anymore. And we're down to the bare minimum. And I know that many taxpayers, their position is offer the least amount you can in order to educate your students. And we're almost there. And that's not the, this is my opinion, Joe. That's not the community I want. I don't want to offer the least possible education to our students. And my, my youngest son's going to graduate next year. This money's not going to help him. If this, if this levy passes, it's not going to help him. I got to pay the property taxes like you do and many other people. But it's not going to help my son. It's going to help the next generation. I don't want to offer the lowest possible education in our community. You might disagree, and, and, and that's okay. But that's my input. Yeah. Well, the other thing I saw, this, uh, this new levy, it, it's, there's no end to it, though. I mean, it's just an open levy, right? Yeah. Well, most levies are because, you know, they, they generate a flat revenue. Joe. So if the levy were to, gen I'm just going to flat, it's, this is not the right number, but if the levy generates a million dollars, it's going to generate a million dollars 10 years from now. A million dollars 10 years from now doesn't buy much in a million dollars today's money. So this is what the state does to us over and over again. They flat fund us and tell us to go to our communities to make up the difference. So then they say the only, only possible revenue, generally speaking, is a property tax levy. We could do an income tax, but we did, decided not to do that is that's gonna generate a flat amount of revenue. Well, the costs go up. Workers' comp insurance goes up every year. The cost just to provide health insurance to our staff goes up every year. Even if we don't do um, salary increases, there's just all of this, this stuff goes up. And, you know, and, and this is a $30 million operation. So it just keeps going up. Yeah, everything's going up for you, but it's not going up for me. I understand. Yeah, I know you understand, but you're still going to go ahead with this. We are, and we're going to leave it to the voters to make their decision as to what uh, they decide. And that brings up the next thing. Uh, uh, how are you, uh, uh, are you advertising this at all? Or, I mean, putting out signs or something? I've talked to a lot of people and, and they haven't even heard about it. And uh, I talked to some people and I said, well, it's in a paper. And they said, well, we don't get the paper. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, so what else can you do to get the word out to people? Um, well, we've done some uh, press releases. I think Bob Dyack is on the call. Bob is the head of the, um, is Bob still here? I can't, I don't know if he's still tuning in, but Bob is the head of the levy committee that is in charge of, and this is a very separate entity from the schools. I want to make that clear. I don't know if you're comfortable talking about that, Bob. I didn't mean to put sure. you on the spot. Sure, no problem. Um, yes, we're, <clears throat> you know, we're in the process of, um, putting things to together in different different manners. Um, there are bits and pieces of information already available. Um, if you're a Facebook uh, user, you can go on uh, the Protect and Preserve uh, web, your Facebook page, and uh, see many of the frequently asked questions that, uh, that you're looking for answers on. And there are quite a few, we understand that. Um, those are on. Those are also on the website of the school. Um, there was a, there was a couple of press releases uh, that went out uh, in probably still in February, and those are still available to read on the website. Um, more to come. Uh, certainly, we're you know we're 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 going to do what we would normally do, uh, trying to communicate with the people in the community. Uh, but it's, you know, I understand it's maybe not early, but uh, for us, it is early. We have to, uh, we have to be careful um, that we get all our ducks in a row and we get our facts right. But anyhow, yeah, more to come. Um, but, but primarily, this, this is available on the websites and on our Facebook page. And Bob, will, will you be putting out signs? Yes, we'll be putting out the yard signs. Uh, that, that'll be a typical 
a uh, typical thing that we do. Um, but, you know, we are, we are going to send postcards to a lot, all the residents uh, with the key information as well. Um, we even have instructions on how to get an absentee ballot out there on our Facebook page. If, if you're not sure how to do that, uh, there's, a, there's, some, there's some instructions that will guide you through that. And then um, it's my understanding there's an informational session coming up as well. That's right. There will be a town hall coming uh, March 30th. Uh, we'll be sending again. This is something you, you, you know, you'll need to look on the website and on the Facebook page to see the link uh, so that you're able to join that, um, that public um, virtual meeting. It will be virtual. Um, so you'll be able to get online and, uh, and listen to um, the topic per se. And it, and it will cover not just the financials, it will cover you know what's going on with the students, maybe a little bit of what you saw today, uh, which, you know, which is really critical. It's, you know, what are we doing for the youth to turn them into citizens, taxpayers, consumers, um, so that they can pay the property taxes in the future. Um, you know, we want our kids to be successful. That's really what it's all about. Uh, make no mistake about that. That's, that's what everybody uh, that's on our committee and people associated with us are, are interested in is these kids need to succeed. It's a tough world out there. And there's nothing more important than uh, continuing uh, having successful adults coming into, into the community. All right, thank you, Bob. We appreciate that. Is there anyone else wishing to address the board? Well, I just want to continue to ask another question here. Uh, when do you think that uh, you're going to be uh, returning to actual meetings instead of these virtual things? Um, I don't know, uh, to be honest. We haven't um, discussed that at this point. Um, could be soon. Um, the vaccine rollouts helped, as it, you know, Angela pointed out, a lot of that um, helpful information. Um, we've actually seen a significant uptick in our participation online. So um, at some point, it'd be nice if we could, it'd be nice to be able to offer both so that folks can do either, um, either attend virtually or attend in person. So I think that'll probably be coming up um, probably within the next couple of months. That's my guess. Okay. Um, I I have, I'm Leah Turner and Hello. I live at 35 West Main Street. I am a parent, a resident, and also a teacher in Madison schools. Um, and I, I just had a couple comments and questions. And my biggest thing I was gonna say, Sean, I really appreciated all the information you started off the meeting with. And I feel like that is really um, valuable information to get into the hands of the voters. And I feel like, um, I just wondered if you have considered making a, like a short informational video, just the same things that you guys talked about tonight. I mean, there were other board members who chimed in with important information that I think would make a difference. And if you gave a four minute video that kind of just covered those big things, you don't have to respond to everybody on Facebook. You don't have to go to the social media and say anything people can just start sharing the video of your important information. Um, and I, I mean, even just a mailer, I know there's people in the community who won't, who don't get, I'm not on social media right now. So I only hear what's going on. Um, the other thing is I, I was just thinking, um, because I don't know, I heard, I think that there was a levy committee meeting. I know I was going, trying to attend them before the pandemic. Um, and I haven't heard when they've had one. So I guess this is that kind of a conversation for that kind of a meeting, but I wanted to just kind of mention that and also ask if we have considered putting, um, if there's gonna be a town hall meeting on Zoom on March 30th, would you consider putting them on some of the school boards as like advertisement, like town hall meeting, you know? So people would know that there is something and if they wanted to go, then they would know. Cause not everybody is on Facebook and, you know, getting all the information. 
um, I guess that was my biggest thing was just to continue to encourage you guys to communicate these things because a lot of people just don't know. So thank you. Thank you, Leah. A lot of those things came up just this <laughs> week on social media. Um, well, it's some of it's just in the news as far as um, stimulus money. So yes, um, I think your suggestions are very good as far as us um, condensing uh, some of the information that I probably rambled a little bit on because I was, I, I just went off the cuff there with some notes, but um, I think that's a very good suggestion and we will try to get the message out that there will be a town hall. Uh, the town hall, by the way, is not a sell for the levy. It's an informational meeting. This is telling people they can come, come and hear a presentation. So I will be moderating that and we will have um, presentations on finances, we'll have present presentations on programming, and then we'll take questions. So, Sean, yes. um, I have already made a note to see if uh, Joe Measle can take that front part of the meeting and um, just make it to its own little video. Uh, I'll be honest, the last time I tried to do that, we almost lost the entire board meeting except for the part <laughs> that I wanted to cut out. So I'll send him the link and let him do his magic on, on that section where all five of the board members spoke after after you. That that was a thought I already had, and I'm glad you're on the same page. So that sounds good. Anyone else wishing to address the board? Are you seeing anything, Mike? I am not. All right, well then we will close the second public participation portion. And do we? Have, I know we have a need for executive session. So Angela, do you remember what section you're, do you have a part? I Mine is number four. May I say something? May, may I sure, address ahead, the board? <laughs> huh? Yes, sure, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that um, because I uh, have been uh, a citizen requested that I uh, pull this levy, and obviously I can't pull it myself, um, but pull the levy off the ballot. And um, uh, I indicated that we would have a discussion about that. Um, I, I just want to state the reasons why I am not in favor of that. Um, and that is because um, um, not only any stimulus money that we get is, you know, this year only, um, it's not going to help in future years. Um, and uh, it has, you know, the restrictions around how we can use it. So it's not gonna balance our budget. Um, but I know there's been a lot of talk in the community about this new house bill that's coming up and you referenced it briefly, Sean, um, that not only does it have to go through the house and the Senate, but even if it were to pass, it would be a few years down the road before we would actually start collecting any money from that. And that it's just a possibility. There is absolutely no dollars attached to it at this time. Um, there is uh, no reason to believe that it's going to pass. It, it seems to have some support, but we've had other house bills in the past. We've had other things come up in the past that promised us more money and it, do, it fails. We don't get it. And quite honestly, numerous times have the state um, committed certain amount of dollars to us and then fall short on that commitment to us. So those are my reasons for why I feel that we should go forward with this levy. And I just wanted to make that statement so that um, I was clear about that. Well, I certainly agree. Um, you know, the, uh, that's why I started the meeting with the way I did as far as board member reports with talking about <clears throat> the federal money that we might get that is again, one time money earmarked for certain things, none of which is gonna help us balance our budget. And again, to reiterate what you're saying, the state is not, it, the state may or may not give us any more money. And if they did give us a slight amount more money for us to finally be able to have 
a small amount of cash reserves. Think of it in terms of your own life. Most of us try to have a little bit of money in the bank for when things come up. That happens for school districts. And not everything is covered by insurance programs or any of those things. Something goes wrong, we have to pay for it. And then we're cutting something else to pay for it. So if our district finally had two weeks worth of cash reserves, I'm comfortable with that. that that's reasonable to me. If we had a month, it would be reasonable. Three months is reasonable. Then that's, that's then we're where we need to be. But just to have a small amount of cash reserves is responsible, you know, so that our treasurer doesn't have to bite his nails every you know, time we have a pay period or have to pay about a large amount of bills to see if we're going to be able to have the money to be able to pay it. Other districts don't have to deal with that. That that no other district, not one district in Lake County, is dealing with those type type of numbers. So, I know I've talked a lot tonight. I didn't mean to, but um, that's okay. And I don't mean to drag this out. I know we, that we need to get into executive session, and and that you know we we have other things that we have to discuss. But I just wanted to make sure that that uh, that was made public. All right, so I, I think I have both needs for executive session here, so. John? Is there, yes. Um, one and four are the two purposes I need. That's what I thought. All right, so I'll read this. Sorry, it's a little bit longer, but do we have a motion to move into executive session for the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of public employees or regulated individuals or the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee or regulated individual unless such person requests a public hearing and preparing for conducting or reviewing negotiations or bargaining sessions with public employees. And number five, oh, please. Five, two. Yes. Oh. And matters required to be kept confidential by federal law rules or state statutes. I'll move. Now I'll move. Second. All right. Any discussion? Roll call. Sean Douglas. Yes. Michael Howry. Yes. Michelle Hayes. Yes. Brian Horvath. Yes. Gene Sensi. Yes. Vote is 5 0. All right. We will now stand in recess. We will not be conducting any business when we return from executive session. Give me a second to stop the recording.